This is ancient Beersheba, Abraham's city, where one of the most unique figures in the Bible came to live while he wandered in God's promised land. Abraham is so special, he's called the friend of God. He became the father of the Jewish people, and he's also the father of all who have faith. But Abraham had his ups and downs. He had struggles, he had crises in his life. And not only that, he was asked to sacrifice his son. Extremely painful, and yet he came through it with faith. We're on a journey as we look at the life of Abraham, and we see how the many special promises he received lead us to the future Messiah, Jesus. On this day of discovery, with Michael Rydelnik, the unbreakable promise, God's covenant with Abraham. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Genesis chapter 12. This is the Negev Desert. And of course, in ancient times, when you took a road trip, it wasn't in a car. It was on one of these guys, a camel. If you can imagine traveling for over 1,200 miles just because God told you, leave your home, leave your family, leave everything you know, and go to the place that I'm going to show you. That's exactly what Abraham did. God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees, out of the Babylonian Empire, to bring him to this place. Now, that story is set strategically in the book of Genesis in the Bible. In the early chapters of Genesis, every time people rebelled against God, shook their fist in defiance, they were going eastward. And then in chapter 11 of Genesis, people move eastward to the plain of Shinar, and there they build a city with a tower, and they name it Babel. But in Hebrew, it's the same word, Babylon. It's the foundations of the city of Babylon. And there in their rebellion, God decides to stir them up a little bit because they so want to be apart from him. And he shakes everything up and they learn different languages and they spread across the earth. But if Babylon represents rebellion against God, right there from the empire, from Babylon, just south of the city of Babylon, God takes a man and says, you follow me. And he picks him up and he moves him back westward. And Abraham traveled along the Fertile Crescent up to Haran and then down to the Promised Land, following the way that God had set up for him. That's the call of Abraham. He left his family, he left his friends, he left his lifestyle, he left everything because he believed God. And here God set up a new standard of one of submission and following him in the Promised Land. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Hebrews chapter 11. We're back in Beersheba, Abraham's city. In fact, we're standing at Abraham's well, as it's traditionally understood. Now, we don't know if this is the well that Abraham dug about 2000 BC when he first came here, but it is an ancient well, and it does remind us that the, the uh, patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, came to this very area and dwelt here, built wells. Now, Abraham came here, and that demonstrates what a man of faith he was. The fact that God called him from Babylon, far off, and said, go to the land that I will show you, and Abraham followed him. That was tremendous faith on Abraham's part. Didn't know where he was going, didn't know what would happen but he trusted God. Abraham had a life that was characterized by faith, and in fact, that faith brought him righteousness. In Genesis 15, 6 in the Bible, it says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. It was not his behavior that brought him righteousness, it was the fact that he believed God, and that, had, that was the characteristic of his whole life. It brought him God's righteousness. God put that upon him because he so valued Abraham's faith. Not only did Abraham have a life that was characterized by faith, 
and that brought him righteousness. It's also very special for Abraham because that's what made him an obedient person. As he believed God, it brought him obedience. In Genesis 26, 5 in the Bible, it speaks about Abraham keeping God's laws, that just because he was a man of faith, he kept God's laws. Here's what it says. Abraham listened to my voice and kept my mandate, my commands, my statutes, and my laws. Now, Abraham had not yet received the law of Moses. That came hundreds of years later. And yet, at the end of his life, the assessment of Abraham's life was that he kept God's laws. It wasn't because he, because he knew them in advance. The reality was that Abraham lived a life of faith. And if any of us lives a life of faith, if we trust God in everything, what it says is that we will keep God's laws. That's how we do it, by living a life of faith. Today, for those of us who know the Messiah Jesus, as we live a life of faith in him, we carry out his commands. So Abraham lived a life of faith and it led to him being obedient to God. Now, that might make us think that Abraham was always perfect. He was far from that. Abraham had his ups and downs, but it was his faith that helped him overcome those inconsistencies. For example, Abraham uh, received a great promise from God and his first response was to not believe God about this land and to go to Egypt in a famine. And when he gets there, he says to Pharaoh that Sarah, his wife, is actually his sister. Now she was a relative and so uh, he might have been able to get away with that, but it was sort of a half truth or whole lie. And it brought trouble to the Egyptians. God then plagued Pharaoh. And when it was revealed to Pharaoh that he had taken the wife of Abraham and that's why God was plaguing him, he sent Abraham out. He gave him great wealth, sort of foreshadows what he would do later on with his people who would go to Egypt and he, Pharaoh would oppress them and then send them out with the wealth of Egypt. But that's what happened with Abraham. He had this inconsistency in his life where he didn't believe. And then you just read a couple of chapters over and Abraham goes and delivers his, his nephew from trouble that he was captured in and he comes and he worships in Jerusalem. You can see Abraham always comes back to faith. It overcomes this inconsistency that he has in his life. Consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3. There were other inconsistencies in Abraham's life. Like all of us, sometimes Abraham decided to take matters into his own hands. For example, God had promised him that he would have a son through whom all the promises God had made would come. And yet, as Abraham approached old age, he didn't have a son. And his wife Sarah was becoming frustrated, so she turned and offered him one of her servant girls to become his wife. And Abraham took Hagar as a second wife and had a son with her named Ishmael. This was taking matters into his own hands and it wasn't satisfying to God. It wasn't acting in faith. And so the Lord came to him and said, I'm going to give you another child, one through Sarah. And it's through this child, Isaac, that the promises will be fulfilled. Abraham said, oh, that Ishmael would live before you. But God said, no, it'll be through Isaac. And at this point, even though he was 99 years old, Abraham believed that God would care for him and God would provide this son. So once again, Abraham's faith made up for these inconsistencies in his life. But of course, the great challenge to Abraham came when God told him to remove Ishmael from his home, to cast him out and to cast away his second wife, Hagar. How could he do this? just let them alone and he argued with God he said oh please don't do this and God said it has to be done but don't worry about Ishmael I'll take care of him in fact I'll bring a great nation out of him so Abraham believed and trusted God for for Ishmael and in fact later on God promises Hagar 
that he would make a great nation of Ishmael. And he did. Well, Abraham at this point was really tested. It seemed that God wanted him to do the very thing that would be opposed to everything that he had promised. He says to him, take your son, Isaac, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a sacrifice to me. Now, Abraham's a great man of faith, and it says in the, in the Bible that God was testing Abraham's faith. But how could he do this, to take a son whom he loved and offer him? And then Abraham obeys. He obeys completely, and he takes his son, who's probably about 17 years old, and leads him to Jerusalem, to Mount Moriah, and there he will offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham was very, very careful to obey, and he told his servants as they went up on Mount Moriah, he says, we are going to go up and worship the Lord, and we will return to you. That's all it says in the Bible in Genesis. But later on in the New Testament, it reveals Abraham's perspective that if the Lord was asking to take the son of promise, whom he had given him finally, and offer him as a sacrifice, then reason had it that Abraham believed that he would be raised again and then come back to his servants. So Abraham went up and offered his son Isaac, bound him, was prepared him as a sacrifice, Isaac says to him, here's the wood and here's the fire, but where's the sacrifice? Can you imagine that father having to say, you are the sacrifice. And just as he raised his hand to offer that boy, an angel came and stopped him. God says, I see that you believe in me with all your heart, that you trust me completely. And so Abraham's great faith was commended there. And then God provided an alternative sacrifice, a ram that was caught in the thicket. God provided for him a sacrifice. Abraham was a man characterized by faith. He's the father of faith. Everyone who ever, ever has faith, we're following in his footsteps. And Abraham's faith was so great that it made him righteous. And also God made him righteous through his faith, that also that God allowed him to be obedient because of his faith. And ultimately, all of Abraham's inconsistencies, which we all have, it's not living a perfect life, we fail. But nevertheless, when we act in faith, God overcomes the inconsistencies in our lives and leads us to obedience. And that's what happened in the life of Abraham. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Galatians chapter 3. Abraham had traveled long distances because God had led him to the land of Canaan and promised him that one day it would belong to his descendants. And yet Abraham had no child. He had no heir. In fact, he complained to God that his heir was Eliezer of Damascus, his servant. And at this point, God wanted to confirm to him that there was nothing Abraham could do that could have ever earned the promises that he received nor could Abraham do anything to lose those promises, but that those promises that God gave Abraham were absolutely unconditional. So God told him, yes, you will have an heir. You'll have many descendants. And then he confirmed it by writing an ancient contract. In those days, the way a contract was made is animals were brought forth for sacrifice. And God told Abraham to bring a three-year-old cow a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he was to lay them out as a sacrifice. And as Abraham did this, it says that in, the, in the Bible, in Genesis, that a deep sleep fell upon him and that a, a fire passed in between. A smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. Now, the way a covenant was usually made in those days is both parties would pass through the pieces of the sacrifice and there they both committed themselves to keeping that contract. In Abraham's case, a deep sleep had fallen upon him. He wasn't passing through it, but rather God's presence passed through those sacrifices and God then became the one who was totally required to keep this contract. It was only on God's side, not on Abraham's. It was an unconditional covenant, one that God promised to keep no matter what. 
On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land. Genesis chapter 15. One of the provisions of God's contract with Abraham, his covenant, was that God promised he would give him all this land. Of course, when we take a look at this land, we wonder, who wants it? I mean, it's dry and barren, it's filled with minerals, and of course, it runs down to the Dead Sea. It doesn't seem like it's the kind of place anyone would want. But when God made this promise to Abram, it was a fertile, beautiful land. It was lush, and it only became this way when God destroyed Sodom. And the way it happened is Abram was, uh, had his flocks here in the Negev and in the wilderness of Judea, and Lot came along with him, his nephew. And Lot's flocks and his shepherds were quarreling with Abraham's shepherds and they just weren't able to work it out. And Abraham decided that the way to settle the matter would, to, would be to give Lot an offer, to look wherever he wanted to go and to take that land that he wanted. And so Lot looked around and decided to come into this general region near, near Sodom. And this was the most fertile, the best land. That's what Lot chose for himself. Now, the reason Abraham could do this was because he knew God had promised him the whole land everything would belong to him. And in fact, right after he made this agreement with Lot, when he told him, you know, we ought to separate because we're brothers, we're relatives, we shouldn't have conflict. God came to Abram and reminded him of his promise. He said to him, after Lot had separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, look from the place where you are, look north, south, east, and west, for I will give you and your offspring forever all the land that you see. Get up and walk from one end of the land to the other, for I will give it to you. Abram was told that from the north in Dan, where there are mountains and streams and beautiful green land, and in the fertile valleys of the Jezreel Valley, and all that area, down to this lush area as it was then, it would all belong to him. God had made a promise to Abram, and it was this land, and Abram could resolve conflict with Lot. He could be generous with him because he could take God at his promise. He believed God would one day give it all to him and therefore he could sacrifice. Abram could be generous because he believed God's promise. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. Genesis chapter 15. When God called Abram and told him that he wanted to follow him, it was in contrast to the problems in Babylon where a city had been built and the people in that city said they wanted to make a great name for themselves. God called Abram out of Babylon and brought him to the promised land and promised that land to him. But also he made another promise, and that was that he would give Abram a great name. Unlike the people of Babylon who wanted to make a name for themselves, God promised Abram that he would give him the great name. And he promised him that he would bless him. He said to him, I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who treat you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham had a special provision that God made for him, and that was that God would bless those who bless him, curse those who cursed him. He would always care for Abraham and his descendant Isaac and Jacob and all of his descendants with this basic provision that was God would bless those who bless those people, curse those who cursed them. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. Hebrews chapter 11. A provision of God's contract with Abram was that he would give him descendants. Over and over, God promised Abram descendants. And finally, he sent him a son, Isaac, through whom the promise would be fulfilled. And yet, then 
God asked Abram to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Abram was willing and God stopped it. And then God reiterated this promise of descendants. He said to him, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. God promised Abram that he would have many, many descendants and they would be innumerable. But not only did he promise him many descendants, he promised him a particular descendant. There's a shift in the Hebrew language, the way this text is written, and it shifts to a singular. It says, your offspring will possess the gates of his enemies, literally. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. He's saying that, Abram, one day you will have a descendant which will possess everything. And in fact, this descendant will bless the whole world. This is the promise that starts in Genesis and leads all through the Bible, leading us on a journey to Jesus, who is that descendant of Abraham who blesses the whole world by his death and resurrection and also by his rule over our lives. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Galatians chapter 3. Abraham's life was a journey. We've taken it with him. The most amazing promises, the most amazing experiences, yet there was a point to it all. When we read the book of Genesis in its entirety, it starts a journey, an odyssey that Abraham was on. And he is told by God, and one of the great promises that he received is that kings will come forth from him. He has promised not just a great nation, but a nation with great kings. And he's also been given a promise that one of his descendants, a very special one, will bless the whole world, that will bring goodness to everyone. And then, after Abraham is dead and gone, as we keep reading the book of Genesis, we see a prophecy, a prediction given to one of his descendants, Judah. And Judah is told in this prediction that someone will come forth from him to who, whose right everything belongs, that a king will come forth from Judah whose right it is and to him will be the obedience of the peoples. And what Judah is promised is that his descendant will be a great king, not just a king over Israel, but a king over all the world whom all the nations will obey. That's the journey that Abraham began, and it's the journey that, that finds its fulfillment in Jesus, the son of Judah, the son of David, the one who was promised to Abraham who would bless the whole world. Our journey began with Abraham, but it leads us to Jesus. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 3. The provisions that God made in the contract with Abraham have always been in effect, but they have not been completely fulfilled. In fact, we look to a future day when all those promises will come to fruition, when they will be fulfilled. For example, the land. While Israel possesses the land now, they don't possess all the land that God promised. One day, they will. And in fact, this land will be completely revitalized. Even this dry, barren area will be restored to life. And in fact, the Dead Sea will live again. Not only the land, but the blessing. One day, the Jewish people will be restored to the head of the nations, it says in the book of Deuteronomy. And in fact, they will be a blessing to all the nations. In the book of Zechariah, it says in the Messianic kingdom, 10 men from every nation will grasp the garment of a Jew and say, let us go with you, for God is in your midst. And the seed, the seed of Abraham will one day come again. He'll sit on the throne that was promised and rule over the Jewish people and the nations and provide all the blessings for the world. And that's when Jesus sits on his throne 
yet in the future. The promises will be fulfilled because God always keeps his word.